Resistance University on Catholic social teaching, the church's best kept secret, uh, an excellent panel to join us tonight for this webinar. Uh, before I introduce them and myself, I thought we'd start off with a prayer written by Pope Benedict the 16th. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Holy Mary, Mother of God, you have given the world its true light, Jesus, your Son, the Son of God. You abandoned yourself completely to and thus became a wellspring of the goodness which flows forth from him. Show us Jesus. Lead us to him. Teach us to know and love him so that we too can become capable of true love and be fountains of living water in the midst of a thirsting world. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So again, I would like to welcome everybody to this Catholic Distance University webinar in conjunction with you, Catholic. My name is Anna Mitchell. I'm the host and producer of the Sunrise Morning Show, which you can hear from 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern on Sacred Heart Radio in Cincinnati, Ohio. We have an app that you can listen to all three hours, or if you're just around the country, you can hear us from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern time on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. And as I was saying before, we have an excellent set of panelists tonight for our discussion on Catholic social teaching. So without further ado, I shall introduce them. Dr. Matthew Bunsen is faculty chair for Catholic Distance University. He's senior contributor for EWTN and a senior fellow for the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. He's the author or co-author of some 50 books and was longtime editor up until this year of the Catholic Almanac for our Sunday Visitor. He teaches courses in church history, history, and Catholic social teaching for CDU. Dr. Bunsen, welcome back to the panel. Always great to be with you. I, I love doing these webinars, especially because I get to spend another hour with you. Uh, likewise, Dr. Bunsen. That's going to be a fun hour ahead. Dr. Marcellino D'Ambrosio, also known as Dr. Italy, is the director of the Crossroads Initiative. His hundreds of articles have been published in numerous Catholic publications like Our Sunday Visitor, Catholic Communio, the Catholic News Service, among others. He's the author of quite a few books himself, including the New York Times bestselling Guide to the Passion, 100 Questions About the Passion of the Christ. He's also a weekly regular on the Sunrise Morning Show and teaches theology for Catholic Distance University. Doc, it's good to see you. Annie, it's a pleasure to see you. And <laughs> thank you to Alyssa and Matthew and everybody else who's on the webinar as well. And last but not least, Professor Alyssa Thorell holds an MTS in Theology, Biotechnology, and Ethics from the Pontifical John Paul II Institute for Marriage and Family Studies at the Catholic University of America. She currently works as a freelance reviewer, editor, and teacher. Her former experiences include working for the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops in the Secretariat of Evangelization and Catechesis as a catechism specialist. She also worked for the Secretariat of Pro-Life Activities at the USCCB as a college campus minister, a middle school and high school abstinence educator. Pretty much she ran the gamut when it comes to education and teaches sacraments in Catholic fundamental moral theology for CDU. Professor Thorell, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Anne. It's very good to be here. So, um, first of all, as just a little note to uh, participants, there is a questions bar that is on your little dashboard panel. Um, it's to the right of my screen. I don't know where it is on yours, but uh, you'll see that there's a place where it says questions. I will have that open throughout the webinar today and we'll be following along and um, I'll, I'll be asking questions participants, particularly at the end, but if there's something that comes up pertinent to the discussion while we're in the midst of it and I happen to notice your question, I will ask it then. But um, be sure to also stick around until the end of this webinar because there is some CDU swag that is available for uh, those of you who stick around until the end and also some free courses too for uh, winners that will be picked at random. So um, certainly incentive to stick to the end, not to mention the fact that this is going to be an excellent discussion. I had a really, really, really hard time narrowing down 
my questions um, on our topic tonight, which is on Catholic social teaching. And Dr. Bonson, I wanted to start the conversation with you. Could you give us sort of an overview of the history and the development of Catholic social teaching in church history? Yeah, well, uh, of course, we could devote uh, multiple <laughs> webinars just to that, that topic. But uh, in a nutshell, uh, if we think of Catholic social teaching as a reflection of the timeless teachings of the church on current situations, on new developments in society and politics and economics, uh, it gives us a little bit of an understanding of why it became so important in the 19th century for the church to apply those teachings to those new circumstances. I'm speaking especially of the Industrial Revolution, when for the first time in, in human history, entire cities are being devoted to the production of goods. And for the first time in human history, we had the growth of capitalism, uh, we had the emergence of factory workers, of laborers. Uh, the, the, the question was, where does human dignity fit into this brand new equation? For workers' rights, what is their duty, what is their obligation, what is best for them? And for those who held capital, what is their relationship with labor? What are their obligations in the proper use of capital, of proper use of labor? All of these things uh, erupted very suddenly, uh, right from the middle of the 19th century. And the church, in her wisdom, really needed to think about this and then to provide answers. Uh, the church always says that we don't provide economic solutions. Uh, we don't propose economic programs, but the church does offer vital teachings in understanding human dignity uh, the human person from this perspective, and then to allow society to reflect on these questions. So in 1891, uh, Pope Leo XIII issued what was considered the Magna Carta of Catholic social thought, and that is the encyclical Rerum Novarum on new things, uh, which I think beautifully captures what the church was grappling with at that point. And since that time, uh, popes have applied that basic starting teaching uh, from Leo the Thirteenth, and they they built on it uh, using the beauty of Catholic teachings, especially the experience learned since Rerum Novarum, uh, in all of the variety of, of new situations that have emerged, uh, and we can chart a perfect thread of teachings, a tapestry of teachings from the time of Leo the Thirteenth all the way uh, to Pope Francis with Laudato Si, and uh, with do justice in particular to the teachings of Pope John Paul II uh, from 1978 to 2005, uh, with multiple encyclicals on social teachings. That's a pretty good overview, Dr. Bunsen. Well, um, thank you for that. Now, um, Dr. D'Ambrosio, I want to move on to you with um, sort of another overview question, if you will. So many Orthodox Catholics or, or conservative Catholics, um, I guess you could say, hear the term Catholic social teaching, or they hear the term social justice, and they'll dismiss it out of hand because they think it's just basically some kind of thinly veiled liberal political agenda. Can you just dispel that to start us off this today? The first thing I would say is that reaching back even further than Pope Leo, of course Pope Leo is not coming out of thin air and dealing with new things like industrialization. He's drawing on not only Thomas Aquinas, but the New Testament, not only the New Testament, but the Old Testament. And one of the things that's really, really important to understand is it was essential to Israel. God got this point across on Mount Sinai. He got it across continually. The prophets tried to get it across. Is that God's stamp of ownership on our life admits of no exceptions, no areas that are just sequestered from religion. Religion impacts every aspect of life. Our, and religion really means our commitment to him, our responsibility to God. And the, the whole Ten Commandments are about justice. You know, the first three are justice to God. The next seven are justice in all major fundamental human relationships. Um, and and that, those Ten Commandments are spelled out. There's 16, uh, I mean, 613 uh, laws in the Old Testament, and many of them have to do with things like property. And, and Jesus talked a whole lot about justice and property and money, probably more than he did about sexual issues. So the point is, 
there really isn't any justification other than I don't like what the church is saying <laughs> to dismiss all this stuff and say, you know, the Pope doesn't have any right to talk about issues that pertain to economics and politics. Uh, and certainly the Pope is not going to, um, and, and the bishops aren't going to tell us about specific solutions um, which demand the creativity and the collaboration of a whole society, uh, labor, you know, uh, management, uh, politics, the state, the family. You know, so if you read uh, all the encyclicals, we're not being really told uh, who to vote for or what particular law to pass, but we're given principles that flow from the gospel itself and from natural law. And these impact poli not politics and economics. You know, that leads me seamlessly to um, what I want to do for the first part of this webinar, which is kind of get a survey of the, the principles of Catholic social teaching. And so, Professor Thorell, I was... Um, I want to go to you next. What does Catholic social teaching have to do with the dignity of the human person? Well, I mean, I think you have to incorporate that as the, the foundation. I mean, when you say what does it have to do with the dignity of the human person, you have two documents over the time um, where we have the dignity of the human person and then, or I should say the dignity of um, the human, but then further the dignity of the person by John Paul II, which really almost, you know, it almost hones in the, the underlying truth that was always present um, throughout, which is just that, and Dr. Ambrosio said this essentially too, that the person is the key or the, the linchpin in a sense of understanding why the church is addressing social teaching in the first place. It, it's not because a perfect society is supposed to be created. I mean, that I think is a great ideal, but the reason behind it is to see people, um, you know, thriving as children of God, as they're called to. And, um, you know, because we're human, that just requires that we address things like clean water and food and shelter as much as it includes our spiritual formation. And I think that, um, you know, it requires a certain philosophical understanding of personhood. You have to accept that there is that spiritual element and that biological element, and those two must be, you know, mutually nurtured if you're going to really understand what kind of rights someone might have or why someone would argue that you should be given health care. You know, I, I think most of those foundational issues, um, they really just come down to if you acknowledge that the human person is, um, you know, a good in and of himself and that that good comes from God and that therefore those rights are given because of that. Um, so, you know, I think it's it, it, everything about social teaching has to do with the human person. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. And and Dr. Monson, you know, we, we speak of the human person, um, you know, like the singular noun person, but we aren't just a world full of individuals. We combine with each other. We form families. We form communities, society. So how does that play into Catholic social teaching? Yeah, well, the, uh, the phrase and the word that uh, we hear all the time in Catholic social teachings, one of the pillars of Catholic social thought uh, is solidarity. It's the idea that, uh, to, to put it colloquially, that we're all in this together, that we must all strive for what is always called the common good, what is the best for as many people as possible. And the, the church begins with the, the, the foundational realization and understanding that the, the human person is made in the image and likeness of God and therefore is endowed with a certain innate dignity. If that's the case, then every person uh, from conception to natural death possesses that dignity. We therefore need to work together uh, to stand in solidarity with every person on the planet, uh, not in sort of the, the hazy way that we hear about government programs, but with an understanding of our common destiny and our common origin as created beings, again, made in the image and likeness of God. So that solidarity then makes it incumbent on all of us uh, to work for, to use that phrase again, the common good of society. And how do we do that? We do that by implementing policies, by living with an understanding of that innate relationship that we have with each other 
uh, and with our creator. Dr. Ambrosio, are there certain truths that, that lay the foundation for Catholic social teaching that are going to be, you know, you think about different races, different cultures, and so there are going to be certain things that are, are good for one culture or another, but are there certain foundational um, truths as human beings that, that you know, obviously that, that are universal? Yes, there are. And we just talked about the dignity of the human person. Now, the dignity of the human person is from the fact that we are creatures. We are we have received our life and our world as a gift from a loving God. Um, actually, natural law can tell you that we receive this from God as a gift. Uh, it doesn't tell you natural law much about God. The, the gospel fills things out a great deal and tells us that this is a gift of love. Um, and so everything is a gift from the Lord that is meant to be shared. When we talked about solidarity a minute ago, Dr. Butson did, but the world, the common good is something that we all ought to be laboring for. And there's a common destination of all goods. That's a very important principle in Catholic social teaching that God created the world for everyone. Um, in God's intent, it's not the, uh, that some people have nothing and many people have uh, abundance is, is not in God's plan. And so private property is uh, an important principle to safeguard the dignity of the individual, but it can be abused and it's not an absolute, for example. And this goes back to the Old Testament with um, there's property in the Old Testament. There's even debt slavery in the Old Testament. Um, Israelites could be taken as slaves. People could be uh, slaves by other Israelites if, if they have to be sold into slavery to satisfy a debt. But that's never permanent. There's a jubilee year in which land that, that has been lost by a family has to be restored. Freedom has to be restored. So from the very beginning, in God's plan, private property is a good, for example, but it's not an absolute. Um, and so this is for a principle that is a very core principle in Catholic social teaching that goes back to the Old Testament. It's biblical. Um, I would also just say, as someone who's spoken and written about Laudato Si, the dignity of the human person means that all of creation uh, needs to be protected for the sake of future generations. And, and like, wasteful lifestyle on the part of the wealthy now creates uh, havoc for the poor. It's usually the poor who suffer the most from pollution, for example. But actually, if the world is created, all creatures are a reflection of God's goodness and glory. We go one step further and say beyond human dignity that actually creation has dignity as, as a uh, the creatures that are subhuman have um, have been created by God, and they're for Christ. You know, all things were created through Him. All things were created for Him. Pope Francis points out that's Colossians one seventeen, and so all of creation uh, we need to care for and tend the garden rather than destroy it. Um, we as human beings have been given it's been given to us as stewards, and so all must benefit, and creation itself must be. Uh, loved and cared for. So that's, these are principles that, you know, that Pope Francis in, in the latest social encyclical Laudato Si has brought out and underlined. It's not out of the blue either. It's Pope Benedict and, and, other, uh, and others have, have been speaking about this, but this is a, another development of doctrine in Catholic social teaching. Sure. And, and, and add, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, I was just going to add that uh, uh, to pick up on Marcellino's uh, comment, Dr. Ambrosio's comment, uh, that in Laudato Si we see the further development of uh, Pope Benedict XVI's own contributions to Catholic social thought, in particular in the area of uh, integral ecology. The idea that uh, the dignity of the human person uh, placed within the dignity of God's creation, that there is that innate relationship uh, in all of creation. And it allows then Pope Francis to make uh, what for some was an almost devastating comment that uh, in recognizing that integral ecology, you cannot on the one hand uh, declare yourself to be for trying to save the environment and on the other be for abortion. Uh, that there is that innate connection uh, between created order, between the beauty of creation and the beauty of created life. Amen to that. And, and Professor Durrell, just to kind of um, to get this sort of overview on, on basic human rights, what are they? <laughs> I mean, I think the first one we all acknowledge would be life. 
um, which you know, Dr. Bunsen just said very eloquently and beautifully, but um, the right to be born and the right to live. Um, but then that kind of stipulates a twofold um, um, level of first necessary things for living, such as food, water, clothing, shelter, things that without those, uh, I think medical care, especially depending on where you live, obviously the the amount of that that's available is very different, but those elements that truly keep us living as, um, you know, organic life, like that is your first level, but you also have the second level of um, a basic education and a right to work because those things necessarily provide the food, the clothing, the shelter, and um, those truly are a right that we possess because, you know, we are called by God to know and love him and serve him. And that necessitates an ability to, you know, to know him to the extent that is proper. I mean, certainly everyone is different in their capabilities and what's available and their own, you know, ability to learn. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, our church has continually said that those are a key element to, to being able to say that we're respecting the rights of others or promoting the rights that those things have to be included. Um, you know, sometimes I think that we hear different different points of view on how to solve the world problem. You know, how do we solve hunger? Or how do we solve, you know, this or that? And a lot of times people end up uh, isolating one element. So you get this, you know, we're going to purify water in this country or we're going to um, donate X amount of money for food. And, you know, and all of those elements obviously do provide a necessary thing and are very good. But um, the church is so, so wise and always reminding us that you have to include every element of the person. And while one piece of those rights is certainly, you know, feeding someone and clothing someone, um, you can't discount the, like, teaching them to read and, you know, helping them to know certain basic truths that probably we all know by natural law, but we may not understand or really contextualize until our minds are opened up and informed. So, um, and that, that leads to the ability to work, obviously, and that is such a, an important thing because, obviously, for families, especially, they rely upon the ability for someone to provide for them. So um, I think all of those things are included, and, um, and the church is so good to us as well because while all of those are basic rights that we have, um, they're not to be forgotten from or to be uh, separated from our, our uh, spiritual development as well. And so um, maybe you won't see that listed as, you know, uh, the right to the Bible or the right to catechesis or um, the right to the Eucharist. I mean, obviously those things are not always available depending on where you are in the world, but um, but those are still a part of that, you know, it's the gift that God has given us is not only to be fulfilled in a human sense of the world here, but obviously our eternal home. So, um, so that's also part of it. Sure. And let me ask you too, as, as sort of a follow up, what is the importance of the family? Mm. <laughs> well, in our church will teach us, I mean, there are many issues, obviously we know surrounding the family, but in terms of social justice, you have your, um, your miniature cell society there, you know, it's the microcosm. Um, and in many ways from what you learn in that early stage of childhood within a family to um, the further development and maturation, all of that is a, a training up for the way that you understand your relationships within a community and within the society as a whole. So um, the church has always emphasized and has continued to teach us that, you know, we have um, an obligation to care for the family, to provide for the family, and to honor the family. And I think Dr. Bunsen said this at the beginning, too, that, um, you know, we have, uh, pardon me, that the, um, the family is kind of your, your core spot for the further development of the community. So um, you see uh, the, the spouses in terms of are they capable of supporting one another? Are they capable of supporting their children? But then are they um, hopefully able to provide education for those children? And I mean, we all know that socially there are many elements that go into that, but uh, the family is kind of your your building block for society. And, you know, um, 
it's it's a sad truth that the further we see family disintegrated or uh, being pulled apart, the more we find that certain structures within society, you know, follow that. And I mean, it goes also back to the basic dignity and right to life. If you're not able to support or defend the most innocent or the most uh, vulnerable, then you know, what will that mean for us as we grow? And, um, you know, it's kind of that wide spectrum of saying within the family context, but also within all of life, like, are your unborn and your elderly the, the most vulnerable and the most, uh, the quickest to be forgotten and the quickest to be un- yeah, uncared for, then um, it doesn't give a lot of hope for all the people in between, you know, even those who do have strength and health and work, um, you know, it, it really does put a, a darkness to the hopes that we have for society as a whole when those who are the most in need are supported. So, um, sorry, Dr. Bunsen, I think you had something to say. Well, I was, I was just going to add to, to amplify one of the things that, that you're talking about. Uh, we have the, the beautiful image of the church as the, of, that the family is the domestic church. And if we go back to the, the church's first encounter with the Industrial Revolution, some of the questions that emerged out of that were very disturbing uh, with the impact that it was causing on the family. We had families that were being separated by work. We had children who were being uh, put into labor, uh, working unbelievable hours in in, in human, unsanitary, and very dangerous conditions. Uh, We had uh, women who were put in positions of a lack of absolute dignity, of, of, of abuse and misuse uh, in the factories. So the, the church was looking at all of these problems and very focused on the impact of industrialization on family life uh, and pertaining as well to the question of human rights, uh, education for children, what is best for the family. And, and that's why when you read through uh, Leo XIII's Encyclical Guerrero Navarre and you read through the subsequent social encyclicals, the church is always coming back to uh, that vital question of the impact of different aspects of the social questions that we're facing on family life, seeing it, of course, as uh, sort of the the canary in the coal mine of the wider health of society and proposing solutions uh, spiritually, uh, but also from the standpoint of unchanging church teaching uh, that we all know work every time they're applied. And I want to ask you more about Rerum Novarum in a minute, but I want to um, finish up the segment, if you will, on on the principles of Catholic social teaching by asking you, Dr. D'Ambrosio, what uh, what does the church mean by preferential option for the poor? Well, I just want to do a little, again, I, I think it's, I'm a historical theologian, you know what I mean? So I'd like to go back and take a look at development. And I just want to point out that in the Old Testament, there were three privileged groups of people that were that got preferential treatment because they depended on God alone. That was widows, orphans, and aliens or strangers. I think this is really telling for some of the debates we have today about the, the, um, the immigration crisis, for example, and how we deal with that. Okay? But in any event, God says these people depend on me alone. So you're going to take care of them. And there was laws about gleaning. You know, we know the story about Ruth and Naomi going to the fields of Boaz. They're destitute, a widow, and and, um, actually a a couple of widows there. And they're they're clinging to each other, helping each other. But, you know, they they go out and glean the fields because that was the law to make sure that you leave something for the widows and the orphans. Um, And so this is God's preference in the Old Testament. This is the Lord's preference in the New in the way he takes care of the poor and the outcast. So the church has always had really in, in, in its teaching based on the gospel and, and the word of God, a preferential option for those who are most in need, who are those who are most dependent. And, and it's rather curious in, in society, in the, in the world, typically those who are most in need and least useful are discarded. That's what Pope Francis calls the throwaway culture. Uh, that includes the unborn who are unwanted. You know, uh, they're they're the, the poor here. So uh, th- this is the, this is the preferential option of the poor means not, not you know in the Old Testament is very clear. You don't in a case of justice in the law courts, you, you don't you're not prejudiced based on someone being poor. 
toward being rich. You know, you, you call it as you see it. Uh, but when it comes to paying attention to and providing for and caring for, um, where are we going to devote our, our attention? We need to, number one, put it on, on the poor. I mean, and then I, just closing, you know, uh, Mother Teresa is very clear about this. And um, when you do something to the least of the brethren, to the unruly poor, you do it to the Lord. And the Lord identifies himself mystically with the poor. So I just want to just say this. In Catholic social teaching, we're not just talking economics and politics. We're really talking spirituality. It's hard to cut ethics off from spirituality. But you see this in Mother Teresa. You see it in Laudato Si. This is a cultivation of our reverence for God, our encounter with God, uh, our, exper our experience of devotion to God, experience of God, devotion to God, is played out in this arena of the preferential option. Well, Professor Thorell, it's like um, what Jesus said, what you do to the least of these, you do unto me, right? Right. And I mean, I think that we we just have to keep in mind, I mean, it's exactly what Dr. Jim Rose is saying, but it is such a challenge to, um, to keep that uh, mentality cultivated, not only beyond the um, big picture things, because it can be very easy to say, we know uh, that we want to protect the unborn or the elderly or to uh, respect those who are in greater need from physical issues or illnesses or, you know, all of the those important things. But it's a lot harder sometimes to keep in mind the practical application of that in our day-to-day -day lives. And I think yeah. you know, so often we forget that the preferential option for the poor in action might be much more of Mother Teresa's adaptation of seeing our neighbor next door who might, you know, just have had a child and need a meal or, you know, um, just some very practical and pragmatic scenarios that are surrounding us that it's, it's quick, um, quickly coming around that we see this, you know, day-to-day -day kind of thing. And I feel like Pope Francis is just such an encouraging example of it. You know, you... Every now and then I'll read uh, these little things about what he used to do uh, as, as uh, the bishop and um, just his attitude of comfort with um, going to go ahead and get on the bus and ride. And I mean, he still does this now as the Holy Father and welcoming people into his home who might not have a home or um, sharing meals with the homeless. And uh, those are very St. Francis-like actions, but it's also a good reminder to us that um, the, the poor can be a definition for anyone who may be spiritually hungry or physically hungry and that it may be someone who's sitting next to us at mass or on the bus as much as it is um, the more broader understanding of it. You know? So I think that's a, a really good way for us to kind of keep it in mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and it's and, uh, an expression too uh, of that basic question of who is my neighbor. And in an age of globalization, this is one of the things that uh, we have seen consistently, especially in the recent popes, uh, Paul VI with Populorum Progressio, John Paul II, uh, and now, of course, Pope Francis uh, with Laudato Si, asking that question, who is my neighbor, but also seeing it through an understanding of the impact of globalization, that my neighbor now uh, is someone in Africa in the Central African Republic, uh, who is desperate for water, uh, who lives in poverty, but who is also facing with problems of dire pollution because transnational corporations, for example, uh, have come in to strip mine, uh, looking for elements that we want in our smartphones and our iPhones and our laptops. Uh, so everything is connected. Uh, so when we talk about something like the preferential option for the poor, uh, it, it's not uh, something ambiguous. It's, it's not uh, it's something that's very vague, that does not actually pertain to us, uh, that we're able to dip in and out of. In fact, we are directly connected uh, with those around the world uh, by the things that we pick up. The technology that we're using right now impacts those who we would call our neighbor. Uh, and we have to be aware of that, and that takes us back to one of those pillars that we were talking about earlier of solidarity. 
Yeah, and I want to stick with you, Dr. Bunsen, because I want you to talk more about uh, Leo the Thirteenth and Rerum Novarum, and and give us a sense of just how important this document has been for the development of Catholic social teaching. Yeah, well, with with Leo the Thirteenth looking at these questions and building it, as uh, Dr. D'Ambrosio uh, wonderfully taught us earlier on those great teachings of the church that go all the way back uh, to creation, to the Old Testament, to the teachings of our Lord, and then to the great minds such as Thomas Aquinas. Let's not forget that uh, Leo XIII was uh, a pope who did everything he could to reinvigorate the church's love and application of the teachings of Thomas Aquinas. And you can see a lot of those teachings in this social encyclical, because Thomas Aquinas, uh, as he touched on almost everything in creation, uh, helped provide a lot of structure to the relationship of people to each other, to society, to the common good. Uh, and then uh, Leo began asking those fundamental questions. What does the church offer? What can the church offer to society in reflecting on the importance of these changes that are all around us? the impact they're having on culture, on society, and of course on the family. He was also very much concerned with the souls of those uh, he had charge over as supreme pastor of souls. But he was also wrestling with a couple of other things that uh, were in development at the same time. The, the first, of course, were the, the great isms. Uh, we have socialism, we have liberalism, we have communism. This is the era in which Das Kapital, uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels were really beginning to propagate ideas uh, that the church would then be encountering and trying to combat for the next hundred years. And the emergence especially of capital, Leo understood that there had to be a vital relationship between labor and capital, between those who held the capital and those who were going to be working to bring that capital to life. As he wrote, you cannot have capital without labor, and you cannot have labor without capital. But he understood innately the relational quality that needed to be brought to bear in the construction of a society that was realistic in understanding the, the impact of industrialization, but at the same time was trying to function uh, toward the common good. Hope since then, uh, have looked back on Rerum Navarum on that basic structure, some of those basic reflections of the church on the need for society, uh, for the wisdom of the church. And if you look, about every 50 years or so, you go to Quadragesimo Anno, you look at Centesimus Annus, which is a mark of the 100th anniversary of Rerum Navarum, these become really touchstone moments of marking the anniversaries of Rerum Navarum itself. It's why John the Twenty Third spoke repeatedly uh, in his social encyclicals, Pachamenteris, Mater et Magistra, about Rerum Novarum as the starting point. It's why it's called the Magna Carta of Catholic social teaching. It's not that there wasn't reflection and teaching on these questions prior to Leo the Thirteenth, but for the first time we had the Pope really beginning a corpus of teachings uh, that he was able then to pass on to his successors who could build on that starting wisdom. And I, I'm continually amazed at how the popes are able to take a document like Rerum Navarum and continually reapply that basic structure of Leo and the insights that Leo provided uh, really are perennial because the teachings of the church are so wonderfully perennial. Can I just ask you, what do you think is the second most important uh, document that the church has for Catholic social teaching? And can you tell us a little bit about it? Just yeah. you know, what you think? Well, I think in terms of documents, uh, personally, uh, this would be my opinion, I'd love to hear what uh, Professor Thorell and, and Dr. D'Ambrosio think too, and what their favorites I are. too. Uh, for me, okay. it, it comes down to the compendium of the social teachings of the church, uh, a document that was put together uh, by the Holy See uh, in much the same way that uh, sort of in the spirit of the catechism of the Catholic Church that pulls together all of the social teachings uh, into one helpful volume. And I, I think what it does is it, it, it gives you an opportunity to sit down and look at the breadth of Catholic teaching, Catholic social thought uh, in the principles and then in what popes have said in particular uh, on specific topics and issues. So that's my, my personal favorite. If, if you're asking uh, 
like encyclicals, social encyclicals, uh, papal teachings. Uh, there are so many to choose from. But for me, a prophetic document uh, was published in 1967 uh, by Paul VI, and that was Populorum Progressio, overshadowed just a year later uh, by Humane Vitae, uh, obviously one of the great documents of our time and an equally prophetic document. If you look at Popular and Progressio, uh, that was celebrated by uh, Pope Benedict XVI in Caritas and Veritate, uh, Popular and Progressio uh, and Humani Vitae stand as two pillars of, I think, Paul's pontificate in anticipating where we are today. In Humani Vitae, he anticipated so perfectly, searingly, where we would end up with a contraceptive culture that we see all around us. In Popular and Progressio, he understood the impact of globalization of transnational corporations and their impact on, on the modern world. Those two together, uh, we can see all the way back in 1967, so much of what we're grappling with now in the 21st century. Uh, Dr. D'Ambrosio, do you care to add? What do you think? The second most important document. No, I can't wait to hear this. No, no. I, I... <laughs> Well, you know, the, the funny thing is that as the popes develop the, the teaching, you know, the latest one becomes, you know, magnificent because it develops the previous ones, leans on all of them. So, you know, that, that's kind of, that's why uh, I was going to say Shentessing was not of um, 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 John Paul II. Um, and, and of course, Laudato sees a little, it's not just a general social encyclical, it's a social encyclical that deals with a particular problem, so it's a little different. Um, but I love it, and I, my field it is more, it, I, I work more in spirituality than I work oftentimes in, um, uh, in evangelization than, than in Catholic social teaching. So uh, that's why I would see is a great favorite of mine, not to mention that St. Francis is my patron saint. So, <laughs> yeah. so I'm, I'm a fan of that, it doesn't mean it's the most important. I love, I, I love what uh, Dr. Munson had to say about Pope Laura Progressio and Paul VI. Uh, I think Paul VI is, is an unsung hero of the modern uh, church, really. Um, and uh, John XXIII is a, is a great favorite of mine, and his personality is so different from Paul VI. Paul VI kind of vanishes in a certain way in his personality between J.P. II and John XXIII, but, but he, uh, he played a pivotal role in Catholic social teaching, for sure. Uh, and I'll ask you about Laudato Si specifically in a little bit, Dr. D'Ambrosio. Yeah, so, so hold tight on that one, um, Professor Thorell. Do you have uh, do you have an opinion here on what you might think would be the second most important? Well, I think I, I would probably, I mean, repeat what they've already said, but I agree with Dr. Bunsen that the um, compendium has a certain added value, just in the sense that you can find so much in one place, and it is like the catechism, such a great resource tool. And when you're trying to, you know, kind of look at the historical context, especially having them in one place where you can go through that information. And um, I guess for people of our culture, or our time, it's, uh, you almost have so much at your fingertips that sometimes you want to have something that you feel like is, okay, this is my Bible on social teaching. And while, of course, there is just more and more and more, and the church will continue to lead us and guide us, it is really excellent to have a resource that, for at least where we're at in our history, we can kind of look at and say, okay, this is how I can contextualize things. So um, I do think that that's probably the what I would have said. <laughs> <laughs> we always think that if, if uh, Catholic social teachings are the church's best kept secret, the compendium is the second best kept secret. <laughs> is it required reading for your course, Doc? Uh, it is. <laughs> I am not at all surprised. Um, sticking with you, Dr. Bunsen, was there anything that was, was promulgated from the Second Vatican Council that sort of expanded or, or added to Catholic social teaching? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, two documents in particular. One is uh, Dignitatis Humanae that uh, really began uh, wonderful work of the church in uh, religious rights and human rights uh, around the world. Uh, but the one that uh, we really can focus on, I think, is Gaudium et Spes uh, on the church in the modern world. Uh, that, of course, uh, uh, Carol Otila, the future Pope John Paul II, uh, contributed to. And Gaudium et Spes, uh, find a document that emerged uh, almost mythically from the floor of 
the Second Vatican Council, if this is something that the bishops really wanted to reflect on, uh, to provide the world uh, and the church with a document that was optimistic in tone, uh, that looks at the state of the modern world, not with eyes of pessimism and gloom, uh, but one that really reflects the joys and the hopes of the modern era. And I, I think the, that particular document uh, did a lot in setting that initial tone of optimism uh, that was found at the end of the council. Now, what followed, of course, very often was the poor interpretation and application of it, which we cannot blame on the, on the church, the council fathers, or, or the documents, certainly, the teachings of the Second Vatican Council. But Gaudi Metzpez, I think, is, is anticipatory in the work of both Paul VI and also John Paul II uh, in grappling with the question of who is man or the human person in the face of modernity and why should we be hopeful, why should we be optimistic and of course the answer which we always find in Catholic social thought is in Christ uh, in, in John Paul II's uh, first encyclical Redemptor Hominis he grappled with the very same question of who is man in light of modernity, and his, his answer is the same, that, that we find the answers to all of the questions, but especially the modern world, in Christ, as we always will. And I think in that sense, and Gaudium et Spes uh, was a perfect capstone uh, to what John the Twenty Third was trying to accomplish, uh, with uh, an understanding that he was trying to do the same thing that Leo was, that the church has always done, and that is to bring to bear the unchanging teachings of the church in new and oftentimes disturbing, anxiety-inducing uh, situations, but one in which we always have to be optimistic. Yeah, Professor Thorell, this is something uh, Gaudium et Spes really um, hit home, the fact that, that we are all created equal, right? Right, absolutely, yeah, and I mean, that had trickled down effects as further documents would kind of draw on speci like specifying that, especially in terms of looking at not just the um, disparity between maybe uh, your social classes, your working class, or your, um, I guess, upper middle class and that kind of thing, but also um, male and female and leading us towards a better looking at what it is for women to work and, um, you know, understanding the dignity of the person really at every level um, and in each context. And I think that uh, Dr. Bunsen so <laughs> well said that it, it has a tone of hope and um, kind of encouragement almost. Uh, and I think that we saw later John Paul II really elaborate upon those um, ideas and, and draw them out in, in a way that uh, really just, like, I think that we still are discovering, uh, even now, elements to that that I don't think we really maybe knew at first. I mean, there's there's so much that came out of John Paul II that I, I think none of us could really say that we, we know it all, you know, I mean, there's just infinite amount of reading in a sense, but it's beautiful because I think that um, what a lot of what his uh, questioning and his um, ideas brought about was a way for people to continue to unpack it in our in our modern culture. And so I think that element of the dignity of each person, um, we kind of question, you know, it, it seems so obvious now, you know, at, at least for, I think, younger generations that, that people assume everyone is equal or that we're going to, um, you know, look at male and female as equivalent in terms of the work or um, all of those elements. But I think that, that there's a, a spiritual element to it that is continuing to be developed or to be more accurately understood, I guess. Um, because at the end of the day, it is about our standing before God as children. And, you know, that's where our identity is coming from. And, um, and of course, that, that doesn't discount the importance of how well we work or how diligently we work or what we bring to um, the social the social community around us. Like, those things certainly need to be evaluated justly and should be. But, um, but that fundamental, you know, goodness um, 
that God first created us and, and said, you are good. You know, um, that's, I think that that um, just elicits a hope for us to continue to better understand that as we apply it in very specific ways throughout our, our modern culture and all of the work that we're doing. I want to stick with John Paul II, but, but well, I do want to stick with John Paul II, but first I'm going to give Dr. D'Ambrosio a chance. Do you have any comments that you want to make on Vatican II and, and Catholic social teaching? I would just say that um, I just read the, uh, the memoirs of Cardinal Sunins, one of the four moderators of the council, who had uh, probably more in the council, I'll go out on a limb and say more in fact, the council than just about anyone other than the two popes being and that's because Pope John XXIII asked him to come up with a schema before the council to help organize the ideas and the documents of the council. And that, that schema was uh, Church of God, what do you have to say for yourself? Which, uh, and that is um, an, an extra, and that's kind of Gaudi that spends. How do you see yourself in relationship to the modern world? And uh, an intra is the, the, dot, the dogmatic constitution on the church, you know, understanding of ourselves. Um, Anyway, Cardinal Students had a pretty important impact, you know, impact on the council. And, and the guy that says, really, it's amazing how many of the all-stars of the council worked on that document. Henri de Lubac wrote part of that document. He was a priest peritus who later was named Cardinal by JP II. John Paul II himself, you know, um, Cardinal Students had a big impact on that. That, that was, a, it, you know, a really important document for the council. And it is essentially Catholic social teaching, you know, in a certain way. Okay, now going back to John Paul II, uh, Dr. Bunsen, it is kind of interesting, um, looking at his impact on, on Catholic social teaching, you talked about Leo XIII, and when when he brought up, when he wrote Rerum Novarum, you're seeing the beginnings of communism. Well, John Paul II saw the end of communism, and isn't that an interesting juxtaposition? It is, uh, and... Uh... What uh, is striking about uh, John Paul II's social encyclicals is that uh, he had in them, and Centesimus Anus, Sumicitudo Rei Socialis, withering critiques of uh, communism, of Marxism, of, uh, in particular, how they fail utterly from an economic standpoint, and certainly from the position of the dignity of the human person. But he also used those social encyclicals to have critiques of capitalism. And uh, what I mean by that is that uh, he didn't side against capitalism, but he reminded everyone, as, as the popes have from the very beginning, of that central place of the person in the equation of our economics. And so for John Paul II, um, Centesima Zanus could have been a, a victory lap. Uh, in, in when it came out in 1991. Uh, instead, he used it, uh, as he always did, as a, as a more powerful teaching tool to say, look, these are the problems that we have uh, in, the, in the question of economics and the social questions. Uh, he did the exact same thing when he went to Poland uh, and right after the fall of communism. Everyone thought he was going to have a party when he visited. Instead, he warned them that you have a, now a vacuum left behind by atheistic communism. Don't fill it uh, with materialism, secularism, and the culture of death. Uh, so John Paul II, uh, much like Paul VI before him, was a prophet in understanding where things had been, but where they could also go uh, if we're not careful and if we're not prudential in understanding uh, where things can go and applying the teachings of the church to avoid them. Yeah. Professor Thorell, what do you think are um, the, the highlights of, of John Paul II's contributions to Catholic social teaching? <laughs> I mean, I think that one of the, perhaps, I mean, I guess it's a personal thing because of the study in bioethics that I just have such an interest in. Um, but I, I feel like he elaborated upon personhood in a way that was completely built upon everything that had already been done. But I feel like he also, I, I guess, I don't know how to explain it other than saying it made it more personal. But um he really elaborates upon the, the heart of someone as well as their, uh, their good, I, or the good that they can accomplish. Um, so I guess I would say his ability to just draw out um, 
the, the, the better, sorry, I'm really not articulating it well, but the, the further goodness that's there within someone beyond just um, the idea of dignity as just um, you're my brother and you deserve it or you're a, another human being and you deserve justice in a very um, simplistic way, but drawing it into a, um, a personal element. So I feel like he, he placed that within every one of his teachings that you had a feeling of, um, of just learning more about what humanity is love and where humanity can go um and I, again that's not a specific teaching in a sense but at the same time i feel like he he is so able to draw that throughout all of his teaching that the more that you read his material the more you discover um a building block of uh the human person is is loved and is people love in X field and in X field and that, and that those things build upon each other. So you end up with a, a sense of, um, not triumph, but uh, a sense of uh, ability to overcome. You know, it's sort of that human spirit idea um, that in facing the many challenges, I mean, as Dr. Bunsen was saying, that there was so much going on in the world that included um, I guess, reasons for fear and reasons for hardship and the fact that um, throughout that, he's consistently encouraging the church to uh, turn to just hope in the human person, you know, and again, that's all from Christ, you know, of course, it, it's drawing us back to Christ, but um, I feel like it's a kind of a line in the sand when you look at where our societies have gone, that that he sort of says, um, you know, for all the progress that we can accomplish and for all the good that that progress will bring us, uh, at the end of the day, you can't eliminate the person from that. And um, that it's, it's just so vital that we remember the reason that the common good exists, you know, that the common good is never um, going to replace the individual person um, and their need for, for, holiness and for wholeness and um i don't know i i'm sorry that that's not as uh, specified but i think that he really contributes just a, a whole understanding of person in a way that um i guess is a little unique to him um but i don't know if dr d'ambrosio has something to add to that yeah i was going to ask you dr d'ambrosio i thought that was a beautiful reflection professor thorell but uh dr d'ambrosio do you have anything to add what do you um what do you think is John Paul II's contribution to Catholic social teaching? Well, can I just comment on the theme uh, that Dr. Bunsen elicited earlier? Just to go back to what he what he had to say about a critique of communism and at the same time a critique of capitalism. The reason I want to talk about this, Anna, is because this has caused a lot of controversy with Pope Francis. Uh, you know, people. Uh, a lot of people in the United States, in the conservative uh, Catholic world, in the conservative political world, they love John Paul II's uh, alliance uh, in a certain way with Ronald Reagan in, in, in helping to bring down really the Soviet empire uh, through his moral authority and spiritual authority, you know. Um, and so they kind of identify him with that critique of communism. But interestingly enough, you know, really John Paul II, in, in, in line with the Bible and Catholic social teaching, the problems, not so much with a free market system, but in the actual practical working out of capitalistic economies around the world, where poor and neglected, where this crony capitalism, where, you know, quite frankly, the wealthy get preferential treatment, get government contracts because oftentimes of corruption, you know, these things, um, the abortion industry in the United States is a for-profit industry, despite the fact that Planned Parenthood is, is a, a non-profit, you know, uh, with, with a CEO that makes $600,000 a year, uh, a cash on the, on the, on the barrel head business, um, you know, so uh, the point I'm making here is that, that, that John Paul II critiqued capitalism. Pope Francis is not all of a sudden the, the liberal pope who's starting a critique of capitalism. There's, that's in Catholic social teaching. And the reason is, 
you know, a free market that's blind and has no regula regulations whatsoever placed upon it reflects human beings. And human beings are made in the image and likeness of God, but we also happen to be victims of original sin. So what we're going to see in, in a free market economy that's not uh, regulated where there's no attempt to, to, to rationally ensure the dignity of your person is you're going to find things like uh, the sex trade. You're going to find things like the pornography business. You're going to find things like the abortion business. So obviously um, it's okay. It's not communist or socialist for our popes and Catholic social teaching to ask some serious questions of capitalistic economies. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Bunsen, your computer glitch just got cleared up just in time. I think you need to turn on your microphone. Um, but I, I'm looking at the questions and I'm seeing Dr. Peter Brown, the academic dean for CBU, saying we've yeah. heard a lot of JP2 love. Um, he wants to know about Pope Francis, but I do not want to skip over Benedict the Sixteenth. What is right. Benedict Sixteenth's contribution to Catholic social teaching? And Dr. Brown, I promise we'll get to Pope Francis. <laughs> yeah, well, in Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. First, my apologies to everyone. Uh, we, were, we were talking about technology earlier. We're all hostage <laughs> to it. So, uh, with Benedict the Sixteenth, with Caritas and Veritate, he did something. A couple of things that were really interesting. The, the, the first, of course, is to celebrate popular progressive, as we were talking earlier. He made note of the contributions of Paul the Sixth, especially the prophetic quality of Paul's writings. And then he used that uh, to sort of mark the occasion about where we are today. And he did it by focusing in particular on the issue of globalization, on a growing global community, and that interconnectedness uh, among all of us, that question of solidarity. But Benedict also focused on the issue of subsidiarity, one of those other sometimes overlooked pillars of Catholic social thought of the importance of bringing things down uh, to the lowest level possible where we can really apply things pastorally uh, in, a, in a way that can do the most good in the hands of those who have the most knowledge about the particular situations facing uh, a community. And so for Benedict, who was so wonderful at looking at the, the, the grand tapestry of theology, uh, we can find in his social thought uh, an almost intimate quality of dealing with the human person in situ, where they are, uh, and the impact uh, that those macro issues have on the smallest and most vulnerable in society. And that's, that's a theme that he kept coming back to. Uh, and in fact, he was criticized for uh, his, his critique of capitalism. Uh, and the encyclical coming as it did right after the 2008 uh, global economic meltdown uh, was one, again, warning of the centrality of the human person in all of the economic financial decisions that we make. And not to forget, as, as Pope Francis uh, has done repeatedly since his election, uh, that the human person always has to be at the very heart of any equation, uh, any formula that we make uh, for economic progress. Um, so let's then move on to Pope Francis. Dr. D'Ambrosio, I told you I'd give you a chance to wax eloquent on <laughs> Laudato Si. What are the, the parts of Laudato Si that make it such a standout document for you? Well, I, I would say that if uh, most people have only heard news clips on Laudato Si, and, and the thing everyone thinks about is Pope Francis, oh my gosh, He's come out in alliance with the climate change people. <laughs> Pope Francis, quite frankly, does talk about climate change, um, and, but very briefly. But really, the fundamental and cyclical, as I mentioned earlier, I think needs to be understood from a spiritual vision of the world. It's named Adato Si after a prayer, a mystical prayer of a mystic, and St. Francis. And that should tip us off. It ends with a magnificent prayer. And I would encourage every single person on this uh, in this webinar to get a copy of Let Out of Sea and actually to pray the closing prayer. It's a lengthy prayer, but it's a beautiful prayer. But it's really fed the whole encyclical by the Psalms. You know, if you pray the Psalms in the Liturgy of the Hours, which I encourage, and that's the, the heart of Catholic spirituality, is the liturgy, which includes the Liturgy of the Hours and feeds us with 150 Psalms. But in the morning, especially in morning prayer, amazing connection with seeing God in creation and praising God with creation for creation. And that's continued on in some of the great 
evening um, canticles that we use from St. Paul. You know, St. Paul has this cosmic view of Christ. You know, again, Colossians 1, Ephesians 1, you know, you see these beautiful uh, odes to Christ through whom everything is made, to whom it, it, everything is moving. He's the origin and source of all things. And that's really the framework of Laudato Si, is this mystical vision of God's creation in Christ. And there, and our, uh, our duty to reverence him, to honor him in and through creation, which means trampling it, it is, is really an offense against him. It's a slap in the face of one who is reflected in every different species. I mean, the, the myriad of, 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 of uh, people. I mean, indiv- human beings are so amazingly individual, and that is a reflection of God's fullness and inexhaustible riches. And the same thing is true with all the species of the world. So the duty to, you know, it's not just uh, tree huggers who caring about, you know, saving weird frogs. Um, and they, obviously, Pope, Pope Francis is not interested in making little toads more important than babies. And that's the beauty of his integral approach, that you, that eco- total integral ecology that Dr. Bunsen talked about earlier. You know, it's all connected. What he keeps saying in the encyclical is everything is connected. Love of creation, love of God, love of the poor. You know, you see these things connected. You know, you see the love of, of, of people now and care for the poor now, but care for future generations. Justice to future generations really means we got to be good stewards of this, our home. Interestingly enough, in Let Out of Sea, you don't see so much uh, talk about the environment. You know, the environment sounds like a laboratory, uh, you know, where you can control things. And, and the Pope kind of, uh, kind of mentions this, that scientific mentality that thinks that you know, we can just turn knobs and, and play around with this thing. Now, this is something that's actually beyond us. Creation is a gift from God, and, and we have to approach it with a certain reverence, not as scientists, but as fellow creatures who've been entrusted with it. And, um, and, and it's, it's a magnificent mystery. So that reverence, that, that respect, um, that, that's what we get out of Let Out of See. That would be so different than an environmentalist manifesto from atheists or, or, you know, just typical liberals. Um, And you see, uh, I would say with Pope Francis in this encyclical, you know, you really see, I think personally, uh, a great respect for how difficult the concrete decisions are about things like global warming or uh, about the water crisis or about any other kinds of pollution. These are complex and difficult kind of decisions. And it's not like he's saying the state ought to make tons more regulations. He's not saying the state shouldn't have any role in it at all. He's saying that everybody, from the individual and our attitude towards consumption to the state, local, uh, you know, uh, like local government, federal government, world, the, the United Nations, which are governments in discussion with each other, businesses, everyone needs to collaborate in a vigorous debate and discussion about the best ways to take action about the various practical issues. One thing about Pope Francis, he is has a holy impatience, and, and you know he's he's the kind of guy who says, "Look, I understand it's complex, but don't use this as an excuse to do nothing." Uh, it, it's it, if you just keep making excuses that things aren't perfectly scientifically verified, that we're absolutely sure that we're going to destroy the planet by increasing temperature through human activity. If they're going to use that as an excuse, okay, sorry, that's wrong. You know, he makes a practical judgment. We got problems with climate change, with pollution. You can't just say it's not a problem, stick your head in the sand. Um, but on the other hand, the solutions are only going to come about from a broad base, uh, from the individual and the family all the way up through United Nations and, and business. So anyway, those are just a few things I'd like to say about Let Out of Sea and why it's such a rich document. Yeah, there were a lot of things from Let Out of Sea that struck me, and I can't believe that we only have five minutes left in this webinar, so we can't go any more. We could do an entire webinar just on... Um, Pope Francis's contribution with Laudato Si, so many interesting points that, that he brings up there. But one, we're just going to have one, one quick point. Yeah, please. To, sure. That uh, Dr. D'Ambrosio has been magnificent tonight and always bringing us back to the Old Testament. And one of the things that uh, really jumps out at anyone who takes the time to read Laudato Si is how Pope Francis builds out from Genesis. That this is one of the 
richest applications of of an understanding of, of an exegesis of Genesis that you're ever actually going to find. And that question that we've been discussing throughout this webinar of who is my neighbor? Am I my brother's keeper? All of those questions he starts with uh, and then applies to the circumstances of today. And so there becomes a, a close connection then between Laudato Si and his post-synodal apostolic exhortation, uh, Amoris Laetitia, because he asks many of those same questions in Amoris, uh, but through the lens of family life. And, and we go back, of course, to that first family of, of Adam and Eve. Okay, I think we're only going to be able to get to two questions, one of which is going to be addressed to all three of you, and I'll ask it as the final question, but I'm going to tell you now what it is so you're thinking about it, which is, um, what is your suggested reading list when it comes to Catholic social teaching? So be thinking about that. Um, but Dr. Bunsen, since you already mentioned a few texts um, earlier for what you do in class, I thought I'd ask you this question from Margaret, which is how do we apply the principle of subsidiarity today? Yeah, well, it's first by uh, in our own lives uh, and that we have an obligation uh, in our domestic church uh, to perfect the virtues, to avail ourselves of the sacraments, to go to confession, to go to the celebration of the Eucharist, to partake of the Eucharist when we are worthy, uh, that we build our own lives uh, to become as holy as we can, uh, to develop that relationship with Christ and to help our spouses, those around us, our children, all of them, uh, to do the same thing, and then to carry that out uh, in our own circles. Uh, subsidiarity means that we begin at the, the most basic structure in society, and, and that's where we are. And uh, that's certainly how the church was first proclaimed uh, across the Roman world uh, in families, and then taken out into the cities. So that would be my recommendation, if you have one way to start uh, applying the principles of subsidiarity in our own lives, that, that would be it. Uh, Dr. D'Ambrosio, we have a couple of questions from people asking if we are allowed to disagree with Pope Francis when it comes to certain political issues that he has spoken out about, like immigration, like building the wall in Mexico, uh, on the border with Mexico, et cetera, et cetera. Are we allowed to disagree with him on those, or is that magisterial teaching? All right. Great question. First of all, I think before anyone disagrees with Pope Francis, they better make sure that they understand Pope Francis and actually read his actual words as opposed to news reports. I, I find that it'd be a big, big problem. Okay, so uh, what is our duty when it comes to Catholic ordinary teaching? You know, the, the magisterium of the Pope is expressed in his homilies. It's not really expressed so much in a, in a interview on a plane. But it, it is expressed in his homilies, in his any of his writings, certainly his encyclicals. Um, and so here's our responsibility. We're supposed to um, approach the ordinary teaching of the church with the religious submission of intellect and will. Okay? When something is defined as a dogma or as revealed by God, we approach it with divine and Catholic faith. So what's the difference between the two? Religious submission of intellect and will means this. We approach the teaching of the Pope and of our bishops with an expectation that the Holy Spirit is guiding them and that we have something to learn. And quite frankly, it's not really all that unusual that we should be challenged in our own personal thinking by the teaching of the church. Okay? We just got to get over this idea that we there's nothing, the only people who need to hear the teaching of the church is the people we disagree with. You know, that's where the Pharisees were. You know, they were above criticism and didn't learn anything. That's a real bad attitude. So I want to ask everybody out there to lay yourself down. Religious submission means you put your intellect and will at the foot of the Holy Father as he teaches. And you do your best to understand what he's saying and to let that, that teaching critique you and challenge you. And you be formed by that teaching as best you can. Um, so it, it's a little different than divine and Catholic faith, where, whereby we say we accept this as divinely revealed, you know, and therefore no questions. You know, God said it, that settles it. You know, that's divine and Catholic faith. This is a little different. 
Um, and I don't think most of us have, have given the kind of the magisterium the hearing that we need. And I just want to, but I do want to say this on, on the issue of immigration. This again goes back not to Pope Francis, but to the Old Testament. Jews, the Lord said to Israel, "You were strangers once, so you take care of the stranger." Interestingly, who is my neighbor? It was a Samaritan who is used by the Lord, who is hated by the Jews, is an enemy of the Jews, you know, uh, a kind of a mongrel, half-breed heretic. That's who is us to a Jew, and he's the hero of the Samaritan story. Um, he takes care of his enemy who's laying in the road, which is a Jew. And so I just want to say that it's very much ingrained in Catholic tradition that uh, those who are seeking for any reason a home uh, are not turned away and persecuted. I, I think there's a real problem with uh, America, with with fundamental, you know, a real conflict with Catholic social teaching to take the position of that uh, a harsh position towards immigrants, whether they be Muslim or Mexican, legal or illegal. Uh, I think there's a there's a real problem. How to to, to come up with a practical solution to uh, an overwhelming immigrant problem? That that. that there's a certain amount of this room for plenty of discussion there, but a hostility uh, and the building of walls. Pope Francis is is pretty clear, and I think uh, the right of emigration, the right of people to to, to live um, in another country, is actually something that's pretty well established in Catholic social teaching. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've come to the end. So, Professor Thorell, I'll start with you. Um, to uh, give any recommended reading for for those who want to learn more about Catholic social teaching. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, obviously there are a plethora of excellent uh, <laughs> materials out there, especially encyclicals, but actually I would say, especially if it's a more introductory level, maybe even start with the catechism. Um, there are some really, you know, broken down simple to digest articles and paragraphs within that that are I think just really poetic culminations of all of the social teaching. It gives you a lot of um, nice play by plays where you can kind of see how one thing builds upon the other. Um, and I believe I, I haven't used it recently, but the USCCB used to have a pretty great flipbook that you could um, use online, the catechism. So even if you don't want to pick up the big heavier text itself and try to find the index, you know, you should be able to actually just search some of those key words like social justice. Um, but I think that's actually a really great place to start if you really want to get um, a kind of an overview and a kind of the foundational pieces going. Um, and I'm sure the doctors have some, you know, excellent like recommendations to offer too. Well, Dr. D'Ambrosio just went black on my screen, so Dr. Bunsen, we'll move on to you. Okay. Uh, well, uh, uh, Professor Thoreau actually just mentioned the USCCB. Uh, I would recommend that uh, if, if you don't know much at all about Catholic social teachings, go to the USCCB.org and uh, you'll find there uh, a very good introduction to Catholic social thought, especially the, the what they call the seven principles of Catholic social teaching. Uh, start with that. Uh, and then I've got to go back to the tried and true book of the compendium. Uh, it, it sounds somewhat intimidating, but actually it makes for a really good read. Uh, it, it's, a, it's sort of a gentle introduction, uh, and uh, some of it's just fun to read, at least for me, you know, I can't speak for others. Uh, <laughs> but then also, uh, take the time, because people really don't. Go and pick, uh, start with Rara Navarro. Uh, it's pretty short, uh, and just start with that and see what you think, because if you, if we can actually have that encounter with the thought of popes, uh, you'd be surprised how much you come away with. Uh, and we learn not just about the, the teachings of the church, but we glimpse a little bit of the mind and even the personalities of, of the popes. I, I go back in particular to uh, the two encyclicals by Pope St. John XXIII of Magister et Magistra and Pacem in Terris, where he absolutely dismantles communism. Uh, and, and, and he has his reputation for being this very gentle person, much in the, in the mold of Pope Francis, and yet his critique of communism, uh, the Soviet system, is absolutely devastating. And you also pick up little bits of his humor. So 
start go straight to those encyclicals uh, because I, I think they're 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 such a grand treasury of teachings. Dr. Van Rosier, do you have anything to add? What would you suggest people read? All of the above. In fact, I, I do want to underline. <laughs> I want to underline with Dr. Bunsen uh, the seven principles of Catholic social teaching from USCC. Uh, org is, is a great little starting place, you know, to get the, the fundamental principles. And I also just want to say that catechism, uh, I'm a fan of reading the popes directly, uh, but I also, you know, the catechism is something that most people who are on this call have, and a good part of, of, of the catechism on uh, the moral section covers Catholic social teaching. So it's woven in there as part, an integral part of, of morality and Catholic teaching right there. And Dr. Bunsen... I understand you're teaching in class soon. It starts up pretty soon, right? Yes. In fact, it starts a week from Monday, a week from this last Monday. Uh, it's uh, a course on understanding the Catholic worldview, and it focuses on Catholic social teachings. Uh, so it's an eight-week course, and uh, you can take it for uh, undergraduate credit, but you can also, there's also a way you can take it for graduate credit. Uh, so this is a, a brand new course being offered by Catholic Distance University. And, and, and I'm, I am genuinely honored to be teaching. Very cool. Well, definitely want to go to cdu.edu to, uh, to check out more about that. Now, as I promised, there's going to be some swag. Um, I think a free class is going to be given away. A free yep. CDU class is going to be given away. And um, I don't know, maybe Dr. Bunsen and Dr. D'Ambrosio will throw in a book or something um, for various people. If you are in the question tab, I want you to type... I want CDU in your little in your little box, your text box there, and just hit enter. And when we see your name there, you will be automatically entered. I see them all coming in now. You'll be automatically entered, and uh, your names will be picked at random. We have your uh, you Catholic people have you, your email addresses since you signed up for this webinar, and uh, you will be contacted directly with um, with whatever it is that you want. So good luck with that, and. Um, Gosh, what an incredible conversation tonight, and I can't believe we hardly scratched the surface. This is going to have to be another topic, um, a, a continued topic that we address with these CDU webinars. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, Professor Alyssa Morell, Dr. Marcelino D'Ambrosio, and Dr. Matthew Bonson, um, thank you all so much for your contributions tonight. Thank you. Great joy to be with you. My well, I, th I thought I would um, end with, um, well, first of all, an invitation for everybody to tune into the Sunrise Morning Show. Um, you'll hear Dr. D'Ambrosio on Friday in our local hour. Dr. Matthew Munson is on all the time with us as well. We'll have to get you on too, Professor Thorell. You've never been on my show. Yeah. I'm gonna, you're going to be hearing from me. You're going to be hearing from me soon. Um, so uh, 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern Time, go to sonrisemorningshow.com, and uh, you can connect with the show that way and find out um, where you can hear us Monday through Friday or get our podcast or our app, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll look forward to talking to you in the morning. And I, I thought I would end with, um, with a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Good. Heavenly Father, you have called us to holiness, which means sharing in your divine life. Fill us with a sense of our true dignity as those called to be your daughters and sons in the world and your ambassadors of justice, love, and peace. Give us the desire to be worthy of this great calling and the courage to live up to it. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Thank you again to our panelists. Thank you again for joining us for this webinar with Catholic, Catholic Distance University. Again, cdu.edu to check out all their classes. And youcatholic.com, they'll be in touch soon too. Thank you so much. Have a great night. God bless.